Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 40K Fireside Podcast. I'm David Gaylor, and I'm joined by my good friend, Vic Vijay. Together, we discuss 40K in the meta from our perspective, along with events we've recently been to and those that have got coming up. So come on down to the fireside and listen. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to episode 45 of 40k fireside it is a joy to be back with you with the podcast version of our episodes uh we're, we're going to try this again we're going to mix and match it a little bit been doing the youtube videos but we're going to focus just on our voice try and get that vibe going again mm-hmm. and we're going to take it back also to something we were doing right near the start dave which was doing tournament recaps getting our feelings and thoughts and our experiences of tournaments we've attended and how that relates to the entire meta and trying to give our listeners some some feedback and ideas that they can take away for their own games. Mm. How are you feeling, Dave? Yeah, good, good. Uh, fun tournament on the weekend. Bit of a smaller mm-hmm. one, but uh, at the same time, it was nice to have a bit of space between the tables for a change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we attended the Northampton GT, which was actually a major level rather than super major level. Mm-hmm. It was played up to seven rounds if you made a top four cut, but only at about 100 players, so a little bit smaller than what we were used to with the UKTC events. Mm-hmm. But it's our first real tournament coming out of the balance data slate. Is that right? Oh, yeah, I think so, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the ITT was the uh, previous tournament two weekends ago, and the balance data slate I think came out on that weekend that it uh, that it happened. So this was the first UKTC event, so to speak, with the balance data slate. Yeah. To make things even more exciting, we both basically brought our favorite factions, didn't we? Yeah. Because uh, you brought your beloved guard, and and I got to jump back to the Eldari now that they've taken a little bit of a hit in the balance slate. Mm-hmm. And uh, in this episode, we're just going to run through some highlights of our games, our lists, and the different kinds of tech we took to, within our factions. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, after we've gone through all of that and our runs, we'll maybe jump back around to talking a little bit about the meta and and where everything sits. Our tier list caused a little bit of a uh, chaos on the internet (laughs) um so you know maybe our our thoughts have changed you'll have to to wait till the end of the episode to to hear about that yeah there we go so like vic mentioned we're doing this in a a different software so we're trying to do this all in one take so we apologize if there's a little uh, error that something uh or comes up like that but uh yeah we you know we had um uh, both Vic and I had a lot of really positive feedback uh, at this tournament for uh, on the podcast, which is uh, which is always lovely. Uh, but um, they just it's a it's always a positive reminder as to why you end up doing it. You know, Vic and I are obviously super passionate about the game, super passionate about uh, sharing our experiences and helping people. And yeah, it really helps to hear the feedback of people actually listening to the podcast, improving. And we got a lot of good feedback on how we could improve the uh, format for only podcast listeners or only video listeners i was uh everyone that i talked to i, I made sure i asked them do you listen on the audio or do you uh, do you watch on youtube and yeah i mean a, a resounding uh, positive effect for the people that uh, had the video content engagement and then the uh audio um uh only people just mentioned that uh yeah sometimes during the tier list or something like that yeah it's good to have a recap summary uh in a pure audio format that doesn't rely on the video so we're going to try and obviously keep working on stuff like that and uh yeah that's um how we try and always improve i mean i think god we've been doing this for what a year and a half or something like Mm -hmm. that maybe even two years at this point so uh we've always tried to keep improving but at the same time we've always done it on our own terms so i think that's what you get with us isn't it it's just the authentic (laughs) vick and dave (laughs) just like we are at the tournaments (laughs) awesome you know what i love about this is that we can do our little jazz music interval oh yeah do you want to do you want a bit of a flavor so originally we were going to go with something like this, but uh, it was oh, a no. bit too oh, no. it was a bit too much. Uh, oh yeah! Um, ding ding! Elevator's going to the third floor. Mario and Luigi <laughs> on forty k <laughs> mushroom side. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we're going to keep it uh, nice and mellow. We do need to sort out the uh, Creative Commons license to uh, get some. Jazz music, as I'm uh, particularly, uh, um, you know, picky when it comes to uh, that kind of music. So, yes, but uh, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy it. Uh, so, why don't we jump straight in, Vic? You were playing Aldari, and I think your list has probably changed the most out of anyone's, right? I mean, I guess you know that faction has changed a lot. So, how many night spinners did you take? <laughs> Can you believe there's no night spinners, no oh. Yin Khan? No Wraith Guard. It's just kind of, I mean, there's still some elements which are the same, but it's it's down to, I think, the kind of play style and list design that a lot of Eldari players who were Eldari players before 
uh, 10th edition mm-hmm. really crave and enjoy. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a craft world called BL Tan. This is the classic green and white craft world. Mm-hmm. We're known for having a lot of aspect warriors. And when you think about Elder, you really do think about their aspect warriors. They're one of the most creative kind of unit designs that Eldar have. And they're a, a signature of Eldar, really. And um, now I think the MSU aspect warrior builds are really good. And they're really fun to play, Dave. I had a lot of fun playing this list. Every game I felt like, okay, you know, this isn't this isn't super strong. It's good, but I have a game. You know, I, I can I can work out a strategy to win any game and I can try my best to achieve it. Um I'll run through the list. So it's got the two characters who you saw before, the Autark Wayleaper with the Phoenix Gem. I've gone for the Howling Banshee Mask rather than the Mandy Blasters that we used to take because I, I think Fights First is a little bit better in this meta. Yep. Um, and then I've also got, uh, so I've got Fugan with that as well and a Farseer Skyrunner. I think it's quite cool now that Farseers have a little bit more value. Being able to flip your, you know, your small number of six fate dice into sixes mm-hmm. is is actually extremely useful. And I found him invaluable. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't run with a no Farseer Eldar list at the moment. Yeah. Um, I've got two transports. So I've got a Wave Serpent and a Falcon. And inside those transports, I'm running three units of five Fire Dragons. Mm. I've gone for all Fusion Guns, so all Assault Weapons and no Fire Pike, which caused a bit of controversy in the Eldar community, interestingly. Um, but I, I, I still stick by that. I like that decision. I've got... Um, Three units, which I just wanted to test at roughly the same point. I've got a unit of five Shadow Spectres, a unit of three Shroud Runners, and a unit of two Sky Weavers. Um, and then we've got three uh, three units of Warp Spiders, just units of five, two units of Swooping Hawks, units of five. And then we've got three single D cannons in the list to, to round off a little bit of, uh, of indirect fire. Mm. Um, it's very balanced. It's got a lot of mission playing elements, characters, some uninteractive bits, um, and the ability to combine output into one area of the board very effectively between the swooping hawks and the warp spiders. Um, so yeah, uh, it's just a, a very all round list when you look at it on paper. Yeah, you got a lot of speed, a lot of shots. And uh, the decans line up really well on the UKTC uh, terrain, don't they? You know, it's pretty often you've got the ability to cover either all three objectives from a ruin that's like quite far forward mm-hmm. or two from a, a ruin that's going to be basically in your like home field objective. Um, yeah. Right. So yeah, so, they line up super nice. Yeah, I, I found that it usually covers like 2.75 objectives. Mm-hmm. That third objective is just like there's a, a bit at the back which you can't get to, okay. but that's still really good from basically your home safe deployment areas. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're very strong in this form and GW, I think. Um, in WTC, I'm not sure the ranges work out quite so perfectly, mm-hmm. um, but in UKTC and GW, they're very strong. And on WTC, they, they also play with the um, you know bases on the ruins as well. Like the base is quite big, so if you touch into drain, it's a bit easy to see you, and then the ruin mm. doesn't cover the whole thing, right? So, we're, but GW has that as well. But their ruins are somewhat placed to create huge, like massive L's, so to speak, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Where you, you, I think artillery in general is very strong in GW. Yeah, you can I, park a lot of it with like absolute safety, basically. It, in, in a way, I'm happy that GW isn't so popular in the UK because I think we would ruin it for the rest of the world. Mm. Um, because I think in America they don't really lean into that so much. Mm. They play very interactive 40k over there, which is a joy for them, I'm sure. Mm. But I think if you brought that massive L um, over to the UK, people would just camp so much indirect fire in that corner. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but speaking about indirect fire, Dave, do you want to do you want to um, do you want to hit us with your um, wow. your list design? Shots fired. <laughs> um, yeah, so obviously the you know obviously guard uh, got a did he get a buff overall? Probably not a buff overall, uh, but um, you know the order buff was nice, the stacking of orders was nice, uh, and the change that allowed buffs to stack. Uh, double fields of five potentially, although I don't think I ever use that. Um, but then it took ninety points across its probably three best platforms, arguably mm-hmm. manticores. So probably a nerf overall. If I had to look back at retrospectively, the the, the list I played for my team event uh, for the two online team events we played, I would probably rather play that than the list I took to this tournament, just mm-hmm. because of ninety points, and I didn't really get as much value out of the orders. But I still think there's a lot to explore there. So I think you know the the, the big benefit being that a lot of uh, their natural predators namely Aldari, uh, were nerfed as well, right? So, mm-hmm. um, you know, Inkan, Night Spinner, 
uh, combo was nerfed, which means that all your um, indirect is mostly safe, which is uh, which was the easiest way to lose the game, more or less, right? You know, um, a really good player would just shoot your indirect, teleport the incarn, flame one piece, split three and two attacks into after multi charging another two pieces of artillery and potentially kill three on turn one. Um, so now that's gone, yeah, God of uh, God of risen up as a lot of things have sunken down, and I think I do. You know, we. Um, well, I guess we'll take, t- talk about it later about where Guard kind of stands and stuff like that as well, because it's been a couple of interesting weeks here. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, my list. Uh, this is a list for UKTC singles, I think. Uh, I was really happy with the list overall, but there's a change I would make. Uh, namely, this list is a lot different compared to like a WTC singles list. Uh, there's a point of difference, which I'll get onto. And then it's obviously quite a bit different from a WTC teams list as well, if you're specifically looking at taking Astro Militarum. So... The list I bring was uh, two tank commanders, one with multi-melters and one with plasma sponsors, but obviously uh, Laz Cannons uh, and Demo Cannons, uh, Leontis, uh, Ursula Creed. I don't take the command squad, so I think I'm the only weirdo that doesn't ever play that. And then I took an infantry squad with uh, the Mortar, of course. So my standard setup would be uh, the infantry squad with Ursula and Leontis, uh, or if they've got no uh, indirect whatsoever or no ability to three-inch deep strike and pressure me, I would just leave them all separate um, because then you just get another, you know, three drops on your opponent and then we get another two drops and then uh, you get to have some screening with some individual pieces as well. Uh, and then I had five cat- uh, 10 Catachan Jungle Fighters. They were really good. I had 30 Kassikin, all with Melter and Plasma. Uh, and then I had two Chimeras. I had two Manticores and two Basilisks and six Bulgren and one scout sentinel off the top of my head which should be about 2000 points um Mm -hmm. yeah it was it was good i think a couple of changes i would probably make is i would instead of the 10 catachan jungle fighters i'd probably go five rattlings i actually found the infiltrator would have been pretty relevant in quite a few of my games Mm -hmm. um especially with the leontis redeploy and, and and it being fixed on how you can redeploy i think the rattlings if you're looking for that unit of chaff the Rattlings are probably better than the uh, than the Kajahan Jungle Fighters, despite the Jungle Fighters getting the pregame move and then OC2 in a bigger um, area. I think the Rattlings probably going to do the same role in that they're going to do a secondary tactical card that you draw on the first turn um, mm-hmm. for free, basically, right? But And just, you know, you know give away nothing. Uh, well, 55 points, for example. But they also allow you the opportunity to block your opponent's infiltrators, which is their main strength there. Nice. Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, you've got a nice mix as well there, Dave. To be honest. Yeah, you know it's got quite a bit of it's got quite a bit of output. But um, yeah, I ran into uh, I ran into some problems, which we'll probably get along with uh, along with later. So, yeah. but yeah, you know, I was pretty happy with the list. You know, I, I mean, I was um, you know painting it all up and uh, getting it all ready. And you know, it's it's always nice when you look back. It's like me, I always you know I'll submit my list and then I'll have tons of painting to do, mm-hmm. and then I'll go look at my list like the day before the tournament and be like, oh man, I got like a lot of stuff. Like, oh yeah, cool. I've even got that. <laughs> cool. Like, cause I haven't looked at it for like four days. Right. So I'll always yeah. be like, I, I came back to this one. I was like, oh nice. Like, man, I got a good amount of stuff. Like got a good mission play, two Chimeras and 30 Kaskin and uh, 10 Catachan Jungle Fighters. Gives me quite a bit of dynamic board play. Um, so yeah, I was pretty happy with it. Um, nice list for a UKTC singles event, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and it actually lined up quite well into uh, the meta, I think looking, mm-hmm. going into the tournament. Um, but uh, yeah, we can get along. We can get into the games uh, in a bit here. But before me, uh, I ended up going four and one, losing to Josh uh, on his Necrons, mm-hmm. and then Vic, you ended up going getting third overall. Yeah, uh, losing in the mirror. Well, I got five uh, zero, and then in the cut, I lost in the in the semis. So yep. uh, yeah, in the mirror, yes. So mm-hmm. yeah, it is what it is. Pain. So, um, what do you think? Uh, what, did you have any? You had an interesting game uh, on round three. I, I think day. round two. So round two. round two was uh, probably my most challenging game. And I did get a few messages about this one because um, Eldari have some bad matchups, I'd say, in this meta. Um, so just for context, this matchup was against Grey Knights. Um, and I think Grey Knights are one of the armies which Eldari do struggle against. Eldari struggle against a few things, in my opinion. And you can narrow them down into categories of indirect fire. They don't like that at all. They also don't like these three inch deep strikes. Hmm. Um, I think the three inch deep strike is very tough to kind of 
um, deal with because if a unit gets into the right place with a three inch deep strike, they can pick up multiple of your units. Mm -hmm. Sure, you've got the MSU aspect of the list, but you don't want to be suffering too much attrition because there's a point where your list suddenly feels like, okay, I can't actually do anything anymore. <laughs> like it's too MSU and I can't uh, bring my damage to bear on something uh, all of a sudden in the mid game. Mm -hmm. So Grey Knights is a nightmare. And I think Grey Knights is a losing game regardless of what mission it is. But this mission was uh, Supply Drop. And Supply yeah. Drop's the mission where your objectives start to disappear in the game and they're progressively worth more. But you can only score points on the objectives in No Man's Land, so in the middle of the board. Alpha yeah, Omega. Yeah, this is nightmare territory. Because really, I want to try and camp in a corner, screen out a corner, and just try and get a little bit of attrition in on the Grey Knight so that I can push a small win by the end of the game. Um, so I'm going into this game as a losing matchup. Now, in teams, that's fine because you're just trying to get as many points as you want. But in singles, you need to find a path to victory in this game. Mm -hmm. My opponent also was no slouch. My opponent was Ed Watts, who's uh, one of the better players in the UK. He's like, consistently done well, and he's, he's made two top four cuts in UK TC Super Majors. Yep. He's also applying for Team England, and he's played Grey Knights for a few tournaments already. So he, he's, he knows what he's doing. Um, and uh, he kind of like talked to me and when he was talking to me, I was like, damn, you really understand what's going on. I'm not going to get an advantage on that. Um, but on this mission, there's a little kind of nuance to it that on the last round of the game, there's only one objective left and it's worth 15 points, which is, which is a lot. <laughs> and the person going second scores at the end of their turn as well. So there's a big person going second advantage. Mm -hmm. Against Grey Knights, it's also very scary if you go first into Grey Knights because they can pick up their units and deep strike on the first turn. Yep. Whereas if they go first, they can't do that. So you kind of get a little bit less pressure on turn one, uh, on round one, sorry. So in this matchup, I really need to go second to A, reduce his pressure in the early game, and B, play to try and get 15 points in the primary. Somehow orchestrate that happening on the last turn of the game to get a small win. Mm. If I don't get the 15 points, I think there's no path to victory for Eldari. Um, so we start playing this game. And uh, Ed's cards are a little bit better than mine. That's what always happens with tactical. Someone's going to draw a little bit better at a certain time. Yeah. It's very stressful um, when it happens because, you know, you could be picking up, like, bring it down and assassinate on round one, and they'll just be getting extend battle lines and area denial or something. Yeah. And then at the end of the game, you're getting, like, investigate signals when you've only got, like, three units left. <laughs> um, so Ed had a little advantage going into the secondaries, but... He only made, in my opinion, one mistake in the game. And his mistake was underestimating the damage output of my army. He looked at all the individual units. And he was like, okay, you've got a unit of Shadow Spectres. Maybe they'll kill one Terminator. Um, so he jumped onto the objective, which would stay at the end of the game. And he put like two or three units around it out of D cannon range. And these are big Terminator units, you know, very tough to kill. Mm -hmm. And he left one Terminator unit holding the objective. Mm -hmm. And my army was scattered all across the board, Dave. And I think in his view, he thought there's no way I can concentrate enough damage to take this objective off him. And he's going to get an eight on the primary at this stage of the game from that objective. Mm -hmm. What actually happened was I was able to put my entire army in, and he didn't expect me to do this. I literally put every single unit I have in my army that could get there, which was about 80% of my army, into this one unit of Terminators and into that position to steal this objective off him. Mm -hmm. Because it not only reduced his primary, but it also got me Storm Hostile objective, um, and also I think Overwhelming Force as well. So I, I drew cards which kind of added up to that. That one turn where my warp spiders rolled a little bit hot and then I rolled a little lower in one or two other areas, it added up to me killing uh, kind of one unit of Terminators and precisioning out a librarian in another squad and taking out a couple of Terminators in that squad as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up killing enough to just about knock him off the objective. And, um, and then I was able to get a mid-game swing. If he had put all three units of Terminators on that objective... I would never have won the game. It's impossible for me. I would have ended up with a zero that turn, which would have been a 18 point swing down for me, basically. Mm. Um, we it's interesting. That's sometimes a, a mistake that I actually see a lot of players make sometimes is they go, 
you know they, they evaluate each unit on an individual perspective right they're like okay i don't want this unit getting shot i don't want that unit getting shot when the reality is is that you're going to have something that will that will get shot right right so you actually don't take any more damage by putting exposing something so to speak right yes i mean he was quite clever because the only unit he kept in range of my d cannons was a unit he jumped up and down and made lone up yeah. So I think his theory was that if my whole army minus the D cannons tried to attack this one unit, there's no way I'm killing it. I see. Um, but the maths is very difficult to do. And as is the board position, is very difficult to assess against a movie army that moves so fast like Eldari. And uh, I was able to get my whole army into there um, and kill this one unit. And then the D cannons were shooting other targets and kind of whittling down his other units. Mm -hmm. um, so then we carry on playing the game and it gets to the last turn of the game. And Ed's got, um, he's got scraps left at this point. He really hasn't got very much. I've still got a bit, but I'm still spread out a little bit across the board because I've kind of like jumped over to get a few secondaries. Mm -hmm. um, and he puts this unit of um, 10 strike Marines. This is his last real unit onto the objective, the final objective. And I have to kill this unit or whittle it down enough to take the objective off him. Um, Ed actually shows some really good sportsmanship here. Um, we had a little bit of an incident the turn before where I'd kind of like set up to tag up all his remaining units and I just completely forgot that I'd even done that and I just carried on moving and said, oh yeah, yeah, my turn's over. And then we go to the start of his turn and I'm like, oh no, Ed, I was meant to charge in over here. Um, we actually didn't do the charge then uh, and we were like, okay, yeah, yeah, carry on, carry on. Uh, it doesn't matter, whatever. Uh, and then he moved he teleported those multiple units over and killed one of my D cannons. Mm. On the very last turn of the game, I shot my whole army into him. We were, we had no time left, so we were doing this super fast. And I shot that third D cannon that died. Mm. And he only just died to the model for me to take that objective off him and get the 15 point swing to win the game. And we were chatting about it and like I told Ed, look, you know, what do you want to do? What are, here are the options? You know, it was fine. If you, if we want to call it there, we can call it there. I'll, I've shot an extra model that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And Ed was an absolute gentleman and made, gentleman and made the decision that if I had just charged his units, which it was like a two inch charge, mm -hmm. he would never have been able to kill the D cannon and the exact number of models that should have died would have died in that last turn. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, gave me the 15 at the end and and I won the game. Nice. Um, so graceful way to play the game. And I think that's a big part of the UKTC circuit actually, yep. is that just across the board, people don't want to win the wrong way. I think even his words were, it would just feel bad to win that way. Yeah. And I think m pretty much all of us would have done the same thing in the other way, which, yeah. which is really nice. So, you know, props to him and props to our scene as a tournament scene. Yep. And uh, stuff like that's super common across the UK as well. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people just don't want to, you know, hey, I don't want to win like that. That's not how I play sort of thing. And um, yeah, yeah it's, it's nice to play. You know, you don't have to come to tournaments like super stressed out. You know, I, I say that to every opponent I play against. Hey, man, I'm super chill. I play this game way too much. You forget something, we just talk it out, chat it out. You know, who cares, right? We just, you know. <laughs> yeah. I want to play the game. I want to I want to see the game the way it would have would have played out should we have not just made some stupid human error, right? Yeah, and I think in terms of sportsmanship, just for the wider community, I think these kinds of things are very important mm -hmm. because, you know, winning the game because you've played a certain way and played very effectively and your strategies worked out, the dice have gone your way is one thing. But winning just because your opponent forgot something or like, you know, you gotcha them or, you know, something very obviously that they'd intended to do, they hadn't done is not in it's fine you can you can win like that but it's not you know it's not a joyous victory it's not no one's it's only a game we, like it always boils down to this yep. it's just a game with no real prizes except for pride and you don't get any pride by winning the wrong way actually the thing that stuck with me the most was when uh i was hanging out with andrew gonyo at uh warhammer world champs actually and um he said something to me he was like i never want to be that guy that people don't want to have lunch with you know mm -hmm. which is like just per to me like perfectly encapsulates it, right like if you're gonna do something where your opponent feels bad that they don't want to have lunch with you like the chances are you know <laughs> you know like what are we doing here right <laughs> right exactly yeah. It's uh, not, uh, you know, we play the game to have fun as well, you know, at the same time. And that's something I've been uh, doing a lot recently as well. So, you know, it's been uh, it's been good fun. Yeah. Cool. So, Grey Knights, bit of a tough one, right? 
Great answer, a bit of a tough one, and I and I feel for Ed because actually every single thing went my way in this game. Yeah, you, um, went, you went second, which was big on the it, right mission, right? I went second. He yeah. like he just slightly miscalculated one thing in the middle of the game, but otherwise he played like an absolutely perfect game. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, a fair play to Ed, and he he took it gracefully as well. Yeah, it's a champ. I've uh, been around the scene for quite a long time. He's a lovely yeah. guy as well. What about you, Dave? On day one, uh, do you want to run through one of your games, pick out one? You know, day one was pretty cruisy. I was uh, just shooting people up. Um, <laughs> can't really remember much of my games, actually. Uh, okay. um, <laughs> yeah, I had some fun ones, you know. Um, had one funny part where I was uh, shooting my Chimera into this guy's Land Raider. And um, I was like, uh, I was like, he was like, oh, should I AOC here? And I was like, look, man, I have like one hunter killers and some like AP zero things and stuff like that. And he was like, oh, okay, you know, I won't. And I was like, okay. I was like, I probably won't do much damage, man. And then, uh, of course, I rolled like um, six damage on my hunter killer missile. <laughs> I was like, fuck, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> Usually this thing does nothing. <laughs> um, Did you yeah. find, Dave, like in a lot of your games, you were playing a little more aggressively? Like, or is it very progressive or is it very defensive? Like, uh, it, you know, it depends, really. Like, I wasn't still pushing, like, as hard as I normally would, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you kind of got to play the game in front of you at the same time as well, right? Like... And singles, I guess, there's not as much uh, um, incentive to push, um, especially with an army like Guard. You know, you can get called out, and Guard are one of those armies that if you do if you do start to take um, bad board positions, it gets really bad really quick. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's an army that has zero ability to fall back and shoot, and it doesn't have a huge melee component in, in addition to that as well. So you've got to make sure that you play your pieces the right way. Um, which yeah. Is, yeah, I mean, I'm asking because this was a big learning point for me in this tournament. I I haven't played any practice games between the last tournament and this one. So I've had zero practice games with the, the latest Eldari, let's say, uh, except for just deploying against myself. Mm -hmm. And when I was playing CSM, I had to learn a play style which was extremely aggressive, it involved threat saturation, placing um, at some point in the game, usually round two or three, you basically place your whole army in front of them, kill as much as you can, and go, look, shoot me. Shoot me, and whatever I have left is going to try and win the game for me. Mm -hmm. um, with the Eldari, my first round, I felt like, okay, I need to be in my differential scoring mode here, take like five units, here we go, let's, yep. let's kill some stuff. And as I went on through this tournament, I put less and less of my army out there. Mm. I only used parts of my army that were either scoring or were going to be unable to be interacted with. Yeah. Um, and I really like that Phantasm is still D6 and a lot of my bases are 25 millimeters. I line up against a wall and I know, look, I could keep this unit safe. Mm -hmm. And I set up one other unit on another side of the board. Yep. And I'm like, you choose one of these and I'm going to save the one which is more difficult for you to deal with. For sure. And I guess Fagan's really good for that, right? Even Warp Spiders are on 25? Yeah, all the Aspect Warriors are. The Autark is basically just a 2 plus to get him out of there, right? So still pretty yep. reliable to do it with the Autark too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. super easy. You're and right. It's completely different play style CSM and Aldari, there, right? Like ultimately, very different. Uh, yeah. You know, you're trying to play for board position and use your speed as the main advantage you have, right? Like your ability to reposition your army. Yeah. That you can play one side really hard and play another side really hard. Where CSM is not like that at all. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, I've found myself using Fire and Fate a lot more than I would have before yep. uh, because that's an extremely powerful stratagem um, and allowed me to score a lot of points, move block a lot, and yep. uh, also just keep my units safe. Like I was getting, I was ending games with all three of my units of Warp Spiders still alive, having activated them multiple times. Feels good, that one. Oh, very good. Yeah. Did you play any ranges in your list again? I forget. No ranges. Okay. No, mm, none. Interesting. No forward deploy, just everything hidden behind walls. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, I played against Gene Steeler Cold, actually, round two. That was, um, that was a good one for guard, though, obviously. Um, but uh, it was refreshing to play against that army again. Um, really nice guy called uh, Connor O'Neill. Now that I look at it, um, lovely guy. Uh, pretty standard list. Uh, he had Abrams, which uh, obviously didn't really shine versus Basilisk. Um, uh, <laughs> it's quite good against that. And I got quite lucky and ended up leaving one Aberrant on one wound left. Yep. So <laughs> needless to say, I just didn't kill that squad at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was a good time. I haven't seen Gene Silicon on the table for quite a while. And I think they're actually not as bad as they, you know, um, I think they've got a lot better after Balanced Data Slate. So it was mm -hmm. interesting and then Fair. i played orcs as well you know i've never lost orcs so that's fine <laughs> <laughs> um, um I, I had a really interesting game against uh tau 
Oh, yeah. um, which which really made me think about the kind of game design that's been incorporated at the moment. Because up to that point, I played against three armies that could turn one deep, uh, not turn, three inch deep strike. Mm. And the difference from going against three inch deep strikes and playing against Tau, who have normal deep strikes, maybe with a rapid ingress, but a normal deep strike and no indirect fire, was so comfortable for me to play, Dave. <laughs> um, I, I could just focus on macro strategy and the D cannons controlled so much of the board, which he couldn't easily enter. Mm -hmm. And I could just, if I just create a little bit of a differential in scoring early game, so maybe I get 10 points ahead. Mm -hmm. It's almost like no matter what he does, no matter, regardless of the dice, I'm going to find a way of winning this game. Yep. Um, and that was very satisfying to play that kind of style. And I really miss the nine inch deep strikes uh, being commonplace. Uh, yeah, I do understand what you're saying and that a lot of armies who have the three, uh, the three inch deep strike for sure. It always mm -hmm. feels good when you lock a tower player out of actually having any chance at winning. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of one of the fundamental flaws of that army, I suppose, isn't it? And having played uh, this game for a while, like the nine inch deep strikes I can just do with my eyes. Like I can move the unit and I know that's like nine inches exactly from the board edge. Yeah. Uh, but the three inch deep strike are so, like it it's so hard to do that in your head because it's always way less than you think it is you know what you need is you need actually even if you're not playing a three inch deep strike army you, you should carry around one of those three inch um uh, markers for you yeah because oftentimes you know you, you'll play against necron obviously you'll play against necrons or something like that right that can three inch so just having one of those i found even i like i bring one uh to steven just because i wasn't even you know, uh, playing with it, but um, mm -hmm. using it for the melt of mine, actually, of course. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I found it super useful as well when I played against uh, Gene Silicon, for example. Yeah. 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 So I enjoyed that game against Finn. He uh, he was super cool and uh, he'd only just started playing 40K as well. So I uh, felt nice. like we both learned a lot in that game. Nice. Um, and then, Dave, your game against Josh was which round? Five? Round four, you know, round, round four. four. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I played against uh, Josh Roberts. Probably the worst list for me to play against in the tournament, I think. Uh, if I'm just looking at uh, other other kind of players on my radar, uh, you've got, um, you know, Josh on Necrons with the 18 Wraith build in Canoptic Court. Uh, then you've got you on Eldari and then Manny on... Um, uh, custodies uh, custodies josh's one was the one that i was probably going to have a problem with um if there was going to be any you know manny's list um you know i've got the two bass lists there i've got a lot of board presence and move blocking and i've got four pieces of indirect mm -hmm. uh so you know, depending on who went first if i went first in that matchup would have been um very good for me and depending and the, the mission i would have played manny on probably would have been hammer and anvil so obviously that's a very good map for um for astro uh for guard as well so i was pretty comfortable in that one and then uh, the way our, our two armies lined up, I felt that I would probably have a significant upper hand in that one as well. Yeah, for sure. Mainly because I've actually just played Aldari now, so <laughs> 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 I'm not going to be like, oh man, what does this guy still do? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that Deacons have a 24 inch range, for example. That's it. <laughs> you know, they only move three as well, Dave. They move three. <laughs> <laughs> and I can just shoot with my Magicor on turn one. So, yep, yep. Um, yeah, so I thought in our game I would. Um, I would see where you would go, and uh, depending on where you placed your D cannons, I'd be able to either just shoot one off and then hold that objective and having and make you commit to that objective with your actual units. Uh, yeah, of course. And I also I also had the um, two Chimera uh, with both with firing deck as well, which is obviously just really good against Eldar. Yeah, as well. and you have a redeploy as well, so it's very yeah, easy exactly for you right. to uh, play around. Yeah, there. so um, I was feeling good about that one, but uh, yeah, I managed. I uh, hit Josh. Uh, we had a great game. Um, uh, but I have I, I do have a little bit of gripe against Necrons, and you know, obviously I've played them, right? So I've played for two tournaments now, yeah. And um, you know, I, I can really understand how players uh, kind of do have a gripe against the way that the army functions right now. It's not a, it's it's not a super great game experience. I think playing against uh, Catan or the Wraiths. I think those are the two big ones on the um, on the uh, chopping block. I think for the next update potentially here. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, so Josh and I are playing on Scorched Earth Hidden Supplies, not Sweeping Clear, uh, sweeping clear the diagonal one from the mid-board 
to the top of your um, top L. Yes, it's yeah, it's sweeping clear. You got it. Yeah, sweeping clear. So actually, you know, UKTC has recently just changed all the missions up, which has been really refreshing. Quite uh, cool. Because, you know, we had them the same ones for like six months, something like that. So, or mm -hmm. uh, well, since the start of 10th edition, really. Uh, so they've, they've made some nice changes there and it, it's been refreshing to play some new missions. Uh, so actually, I caught Josh on the better mission. Uh, I th originally, I thought we were playing Corners, uh, Search and Destroy, but we're playing Sweeping Clear, which is better for me. It's traditionally, it's a very good shooting army deployment. And the reason that is because it's a it's a it's a long surface area deployment uh, where the middle is typically reasonably open. Uh, you can hold one objective from behind a ruin, which for a shooting army is good, uh, and it's quite far away from other staging ruins. In addition to that, uh, outflank is quite good on one side of the board. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, at least I've caught him on a, on a good mission here. Um, the game kind of came down to one really pivotal moment. Now I made some small errors, I think, in my macro strategy. I could have focused on a better game plan and trying to make sure I cleared off his back end um, so that I could, when I respawn my Cascans, come back in his backfield to force him to have to dedicate more units back um, instead of pushing them forward. So I think there was a small error, and that only costed me uh, two pieces of my indirect activation. So it's not like I played it hugely wrong. I just lost two pieces of indirect activation, mm -hmm. uh, which is pro is very unlikely to kill either five immortals with Ceres or, you know, if I do roll well, two manticores can kill three scarabs. So potentially I missed out on killing three scarabs, which, you know, could have been quite a bit. Um, so that's where I think I made one mistake that game. But what I did was, um, is actually really good, is I, I actually redeployed my, my two tank commanders back into strat reserve. Okay. And the reason why I did that is because I knew at some point in the game I don't have the ability to push his one of his home uh, his out you know um, no man's land objectives because I'm never going to just drive a tank up there and shoot it obviously right like mm. I mean his stuff's faster than me it's not going to happen even if I wrap an ingressor I can I you know I could move and then he could always um reactive move before I can see around the ruin and it's just I mean what is my tank doing now <laughs> um, what I would rather do is secure my top uh, my top objective and my home objective. Um, and then clear out anything within like a 20 inch radius of that objective and then uh, be better at scoring tactical cards. And mm -hmm. I said, I said to Josh before, I was like, look, honestly, I think it's going to come down to the cards in this one. That's how, like, that's how close I had it. I had it as like 10, 10, very drawish range. Uh, a swing can make a big difference. And then the cards are going to be a really impactful in this one, primarily because both of us don't want to commit anything to the board i can probably commit a little bit better than josh because i can respawn units so it doesn't cost me anything per se uh whereas if josh commits something uh you know he's got akinthrites to do that but i can kill them with my indirect early so if he does draw something like um timney target in the middle or um you know behind any lines or something like that or whatever he's gonna have to commit a natural unit to do that so mm -hmm. i was hoping that the cards would fall my way and, uh, you know, unfortunately they didn't. It was one of those games where I drew, you know, assassinate, bring it down, whatever, in the first one or two turns or something like that, you know. And, you know, props to Josh's list, though. It doesn't really give up cards like that very easy. So it's definitely a strength to the Canoptic uh, court list. But it it does bug me a little bit when, I mean, you know, we've all been there, right? You know, where when the cards, they just don't, some games you get tactical cards. They just line up exactly how you want to play the game, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like turn four, turn five, getting behind enemy lines, whatever, you know, deploy teleport homers in the same term as BL. Uh, you know, for turn one, you've got maybe a dud plus area denial or deploy homers or extend battle lines or something, you know. Um, so it doesn't feel great when you draw that overwhelming force when he's not on any objectives, assassinate, bring it down, and uh, scoring literally zero. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's pretty tough. But there was one big point in the game where actually on his turn one, he actually brought one of his Wraith units out to um, attack my um, No Man's Land objective, which was really bizarre because I had both my tank commanders in outflank. And basically what it allowed me to do is come in from outflank with both my tank commanders um, and actually just go straight into one Wraith brick nice. on a, in a board position where I wanted them to be anyway. And the only reason I put them in strat reserve was because if I went second, uh, I couldn't um, move and then shoot something on turn one. I would have had to have moved, potentially got shot by Doomstalkers, then moved again to shoot something in, re in return. Mm -hmm. So outflank kind of saved me to, uh, the possibility of getting shot before I'd actually had the turn to activate. And yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, I put two tank commanders with reroll ones, the Scout Sentinel, uh, a piece of indirect, 20 Kassikans, uh, a Chimera into a Wraith Brick uh, with command point reroll to, um, to, to reroll the number of shots in the demo cannon and killed like four Wraiths. 
I was like, like <laughs> pain, so like, much pain. Like, what's going on here, guys? Like, like, come on. Um, it's just yeah, and that moment was super, super important. Um, you know, I don't think that the, the you know I don't want to complain about dice too much, but the dice were pretty rough on my side. Um, it, it just you know uh, he you know in his return game he and his return turn he shoots my tank commander down to four wounds. He charges it with two wraiths. And then I have a three up save. He's wounding on fives. You know, it's like I fail three in a row. And then my tank commander dies. I'm just like, it's, <laughs> of course, that's my one with my multi melters in front that I don't really care if he tags, of course. And it's just just everything like that. Um, you know, I, I go into combat to tag up his race with my Chimera at one end and my Leontis at another. Two wraiths spike and kill my Leontis from full. And I'm just like, you know, um, it was a bit tough. So I think that game was uh, 7186. But, um, you know, if I actually just kill that unit of wraiths uh, at the top side, then the game is just completely changed. Um, especially if, like, if, if that had happened and my cards have been a little bit better, I'm probably winning that game in a, a three, four, five point game. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the it, it, it's just quite and this is kind of going back to what I was saying before, it's been a bit of a monologue, but it can be quite binary sometimes when you play against Necrons and that, did you kill the Catan? Did you not kill the Catan? Four ups, five up, feel no pains. Uh, you know, Wraith's just four ups, five ups. You know, it's just, it, it just gets a little bit um, uh, repetitive, but it's so impactful whether you kill them or don't. And at some point in the game, it just feels like, Josh and I are playing a game, but I'm just, we're just rolling dice against each other. And um, whoever gets the better end of that dice roll and, and a lot of really important parts is not really up to player skill. It's just up to, okay, well, my dice were a lot better than you in that point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have the same experience but against Necrons, but after I mean... playing them, I, I, I know that feeling when you have an, a Catan that's like in a spot and you're just like, man, if I just pass all my four ups, it's just instantly game over. I think Necrons, from a design perspective, have always been a frustrating army to play against. As long as I can remember, they've always done it with these kind of large bricks of units, and now they've got smaller bricks of incredibly annoying things to kill, which come back if you don't kill them. And I think in the game at the moment, we've got a, an increase in four up invulnerable saves. Yeah, And four up invulnerable saves always come hand in hand with um, a lot of swinginess. Yeah. Some feels bad. If one person is going to feel bad. Uh, it's very rare that you're bang on average, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so someone's going to feel like they've either rolled badly or rolled well. And uh, the influence that can have on the game is incredibly large um, yeah. because these are often very heavy board control armies. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, I took the L on that one. But, um, yeah, great game all over. I um, was pretty happy how I played that. I think... Would I've done much differently? Not really. I mean, I, you know, to be honest with you, in some ways, I had the ideal setup. I had the tank, I had the multi melter and the plasma tank commander. So, right. you know, I had the blast into the uh, wraiths. You know, everything lined up. Outflank came in, shot one squad. I mean, ideally, I just want to shoot one squad as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, Trying to absolutely kill it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's just how it is. I, that canoptic, you know, the canoptic court uh, build is it's got strengths and weaknesses right um but that's the one kind of archetype which god will struggle more against like it's easier for me to kill katan and deal mm. with katan than it is 18 wraiths uh particularly because of the lone op strat as well it means that it's actually difficult for me to get my whole army within 12 to guarantee that i can activate everything before mm -hmm. they can just loan up one part of it and uh and keep it alive as well um so which didn't end up happening in this one i was within 12 uh, uh anyway so yeah i think you often can get within 12 to be honest yeah. um but it's uh, yeah i mean this path that's happening now is quite ideal for me to try and uh, compete to win the tournament mm -hmm. um, yeah for sure because i mean i have <laughs> Uh, your uh, Ur Ur I'm gonna cut to some emergency music. Emergency music. <laughs> there we go, people. We have the technology. This is oh. the jazz interlude. Can That's you hear right. me? I cut to the music. I cut to the music. Oh, perfect! You <laughs> saved it. <laughs> and we're back. You were saying. What was? I don't know what you were saying. Uh, you were I was saying talking about paths to, um, to victory. My paths to victory was I would lose to Dave because Garda mm. guard are much better than Eldar in that particular matchup. And then I would probably lose to the Necron rates as well. I don't quite have the output to really spike through that with this current list. Maybe I could. You never know. I'm a bit swingy. Um, Custodes, that's one man he was playing. 
that's kind of uh, possible, I think. I yep. think I could deal with that one. Yep. Uh, they're moving on foot. I can move block them, you know. I can yep. buy myself a bit of time. Can't, uh, unfortunately, move block um, the, the Necron rates. Mm. Yep. And uh, so uh, you playing against Josh, great for me. And then after that, Josh played against Manny. Mm. Great for me because Manny's custodians beat the Necron rates. And you know what's interesting is uh, you were set, you said at the tournament too, you know, there's a, there's, I don't know if it's this meta, but it feels like there are some rock, paper, scissors elements, right? Like I knew of, I just, I just knew in the back of my head, like there's no way 18 wraiths, uh, Canoptic court has any chance against custodies. Just, no, it, it just doesn't. never happens. Like I don't care how big the player skill gap is, uh, you know, 35 odd custodians, just like they just want to tango with wraiths the whole time on objectives. You, you just don't have anywhere near the output to kill that. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's not even a game almost when you rock up to the table. I mean, if you have three Doom Stalkers, like, probably not still. Like, no, because uh, the, the turn that they can shoot and compete is the turn when the four wards, uh, feel no pains are up. Exactly, right. And uh, yeah, with four wounds on the Wardens too, you know, you need to average eight damage to kill a Warden, which is uh, Doomstalker. <laughs> that's, six, that's six wounds for a Doom Stalker because you pass three on average. And yeah. That's nine damage on one. And you could still spike a little bit. We should lose one. So if so, a Doomstalker should kill one Warden, basically. Something like that, right? Right. So, yeah. No, they're also minus one to wound, aren't they? So you're winning on three. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, not no good. chance. So it's a, it's a weird part of the game, right? Like it's, you know, it's uh, obviously a it's good. run has a big impact. I think it's good. Really? I love rock, paper, scissors because, I mean, maybe for us trying to win tournaments, it's not good because it's hard to narrow down to one list that will give us the best possible chance. Right. But... You know, with some clever analysis of the meta, the players that are attending events, you can maybe pick the ones which are ideal. Um, but you've got to, you you know, you're always in it for a chance. And, uh, you know, no one's just going to go and dominate the tournament just because of their army choice. I think I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's interesting. I, um, I would rather have like a large amount of like player skill expression be the defining factor of one. Yeah, that's one what one. it is. A rock, paper, scissors is a little bit like that. How is it like that at all? Uh, it's not. But, <laughs> I, I mean... What are you talking about, man? <laughs> okay, maybe it's too extreme rock, paper, scissors. Maybe that's what you're saying. But... Yeah, I mean, going to, a, going to a table and having a game that you basically can't win is, like, that's not great, right? Right. But I don't think Eldar are the problem in this. I'm just going to say that. I'm going to... I think I, God, I yep. uh, Necrons... If you get rid of those two, I think the rest of the meta plays a non-rock, paper, scissors kind of game. Yeah, but having said that, though, what I'm, I guess the, di- the distinguishing part here is that the game between the Custodies and the 18 Wraith build is, like, way more deterministic than, like, if you and I were to play, right? Mm-hmm. Like, is, there's still a, a level of interactability there, and, you know, you've got loan op, I still need to play around ranges, et cetera, et cetera. No, right? I've got like, no loan op, mate. I've only got one Autark. And my only path to victory in a game against God is Autark. then. What do you mean? You, so you've got one. That's what I said. Oh, <laughs> no. Yeah, but one, the way you said it made it sound like my whole army was low enough. Yeah, but Fuegan, Fuegan behind a ruin, you know, he's small behind a ruin, right? Like, it's like, I can't exactly get around and shoot him, and he's got two up save, right? Yeah, theoretically, if I'm in a completely enclosed ruin, your Manticores and Bassets shouldn't be able to shoot this model. I'm just saying, GW. <laughs> you need to chill out with your indirect fire rolls, you know? Um, and uh, uh, my only path to victory in that game is just to go front line with my whole army and hope for the best, uh, going first, okay. I think uh unfortunately but it is what it is okay that's it's interesting i don't think that's a great game state for for games like that i but but what i would say is a lot of the games do feel like the better player wins but yeah. all i was saying is that in those particular circumstances like i feel the way that i play against necrons is very good but at the same time it didn't actually matter how well i, I played because so, it came down to a point where i rolled dice you rolled dice and yes something happened now i'm gonna i'm gonna come back around to my point about this meta being good the there are only there's only one bad thing about this meta in my opinion and i think that indirect fire is still too good that creates the situation we just talked about between your army versus a number of different armies that would struggle to go uh, second against indirect fire but yeah. Sure. But the other issue, which is creating the rock, paper, scissors in our particular four matchups here, is that two of the armies, the Custodes and the Necron Raids, are extremely skewed armies. Right. And skew armies will always have a bad, like a rock, paper, scissors bad matchup. 
My like the Eldar I brought, or you know, one of a number of other armies that are there. Basically, everything else I don't think would have skewed matchups except against indirect fire. Like it might be hard for me to beat the rates, but I could. It might be hard for me to beat the custodies, but I could. But I can't beat indirect fire. But just just to put it out there, Vic, you, I'm playing 120 points more indirect than you, right? Uh, my three D cannons. Yeah. I mean, it's yes. basically the same point as a, as a basilisk, right? <laughs> yeah, like, but like 150 points more or something. But right? you can't you can't get tabled by 3D cannons. You like, can't get tabled by two manticores and two basilisks. You can if you're Eldar. <laughs> okay, <right. laughs> no, the the level of attrition is very very different between those two. Sure, but for, I will put it out there for the vast majority though. Like the indirect doesn't table people, right? Like it's it. It yeah. creates attrition, right? It cre- puts yeah, you on a on a clock, yeah. and uh, that's been a fundamental problem with indirect fire across multiple editions. Is that when there is one good, like very good indirect fire that you can build your army around, that creates rock paper scissors situations that you mentioned. It's, well, okay, but okay, uh, I would disagree because the rock paper scissors and the rock paper scissors part I was exactly mentioning involved zero indirect fire whatsoever. Uh, between the Necrons and the yeah, Custodes, course, right? but they're skewed armies. That's like I mean, saying you put tw- twelve Chaos Knights against an army full of anti-tank. Yeah, okay, I understand that. But my the, the guard army I played isn't exactly skewed. No. Yeah, uh, well, it's not, skewed. No, it's, it's not. not. It's not. It's not. It's an indirect fire army, but it's not no, skewed. It's, not. it's got <laughs> no. I, I refuse to believe this. It's got two hundred. It's got like f- f- six hundred and twenty points of indirect, right? Okay. No, forget the points. It's not about the points. It's about the pieces. True. I mean, I have 40 troops, two tanks, and two transports and yes. characters, right? Like, I mean, this is, you know, I mean, World Eaters is more skewed than my army, right? Because it's just mm-hmm. all melee, right? I, I think it's one of the more rounded armies, if, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. I've even got six Bulgren. i got combat, right? <laughs> so I'm not taking it. I'm You're okay, Mary. You have transports, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, That's what I'm saying. i got but, everything. But if you could put a Manticore's gun on your Chimera, you would. I probably would, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. I, I mean, I think honestly, I think Necrons are a part of the a part of the issue there, and I think they were obviously very strong before the balanced data slate, and um, they're continuing to be very strong as well. Like, mm-hmm. how many race do you think a Manticore kills, man? <laughs> Not many, yeah, no. but it does add up. No, uh, it doesn't. It literally doesn't <laughs> add up. You kill one, they resurrect it, and then they heal it. It doesn't add up. <laughs> but if the Manticores were Eldar Aspect Warriors, you know, that's the thing. That's how I feel. Fucking do more damage from it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, the, the, the obvious answer is that you don't shoot the race with your Manticore. <laughs> you shoot <laughs> everything else. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm. But, um, yeah, so um, that's interesting. You know, I had a lot of fun playing Guard. I don't think my build was optimal. I think um, mm-hmm. there's a lot, of, uh, lot of cool things to explore. Like... Um, you know, guard. They have such a huge uh, line of uh, models that are available, right? Like a massive amount of data sheets. And one thing I love about Warhammer is that when the meta shifts, previously things that weren't good suddenly become good because something else has become good in the meta. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's just a bunch of stuff. You know, like, uh, um, yeah. You know, uh, well, okay, I wasn't going to name an indirect piece, but you know, previously the Medusa carriage um, is a lot more interesting now because the Manticore went up in points, right? So. You know, what's the damage output ratio between three Medusas versus two Manticores, for example? You know, it's kind of interesting. Do you play do you play two Manticores, two Basilisks, or do you play two Manticores, two Medusas, one um, uh, one Basilisk or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, stuff like that, you know, and and the uh, infantry squads and stuff like that. So Scions might be interesting. And uh, yeah, so I'm um, going to be uh, trying out some new things. Obviously, we've got, I mean, Nick Swordman's not going to be for a while, so it'll probably just be for uh, WTC teams. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Okay. Cool. That was a good discussion. I like that. Yeah. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you think about the about the rock paper scissors part of meta. <laughs> let us let us know what you think about Necrons too, because I've played them. You know, raised. You know, just four ups, five. It just feels like, man. Every time I was rolling shots into Josh, it's just like five saves from my demo cannon, <laughs> one failed. I'm like, great. Oh, but if yeah. he'd failed four, you know, if he yeah, if he failed four, it would have been a completely different game. <laughs> Nothing I could do about that. I had a game. I had a game earlier where I shot one demo cannon, killed three wraiths, and I was like, "That was a lot higher than I was expecting." <laughs> On completely even dice, he was as likely to fail four as he was to fail one. Even though it didn't, it doesn't feel like that way when it goes wrong for you. Uh, oh. yes, of course, of course. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's good. What? So I guess um, 
let's i'll tell you what let's take a break for a second and then we'll come back and uh have a, an assessment of kind of the meta and and what we okay. think after after having our first tournament so we'll catch you guys back in a bit at the uh fire side oh it's the elevator again <laughs> <laughs> oh no all the way to floor zero mate uh, it's all going down <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my poor mandicles. <laughs> if only they were on chimeras. Oh, no. The chimera would probably be quite balanced, actually, if it had a mandicle. <laughs> oh, please, Dave. <laughs> uh. I tried to, my chimera tried to take so many rates that game, but uh, let's be honest. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll take you at multiple points. And I'll feel like, and then, yeah, great. Didn't do it. Leontis uh, dealt two damage to the race. Oh, there you go. Optimal. It wasn't good. It wasn't good. My Keskin... Oh, the abrupt cut though. I need to pull that out. <laughs> but uh, we're back. I guess we just keep talking, uh, talking smack across the break as well. Vic, what was your uh, thoughts about the meta? You know, we obviously did the tier list yes. where you abruptly put Guard as number one, and I put it behind Necrons and Space Marines. Therefore, I am much smarter than you. Um. <laughs> but I mean, I've already been because what happened was so Reddit's amazing. I love. Oh Reddit. yeah, let's get it. Let's cover this because we had we have found. A new source of <laughs> sodium, a, a, a deep, a deep vent. It's a, a well of sodium. Rich amount mm. of sodium in it, mm -hmm. and I, I'm going to be honest with you, it's the guard player base. Um, <laughs> I already know that we're going to get angry comments. Anyone, oh no, Dave! Why did you have to single them out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's quite, it's quite, it was fascinating the amount of uh, the amount of salt that came from uh, a single player base. But um, you know, obviously, I'm a huge guard fan, so uh, you know, we're one and we're brothers. But um, I think it goes wider than that. I don't think it's just the guard player base. Oh, I see what you're doing. You're I, trying to appease them. No, I think as a wider community, um, when rules just come out. People's, like the wide community, the overall consensus is very hit or miss, whether it's correct or wrong. Sure. Now, I'm not saying we are absolutely correct here, but I think as much as maybe we are slightly overrating guard, I think the majority of the community is significantly underrating them. Yep. And uh, here's, here's the exact mm -hmm. use case for Ibuk. Mm -hmm. I went four and one. I lost to Josh Roberts. Which puts me at a eighty percent win rate, right? Mm -hmm. Now Guard had a forty percent win rate over the weekend. That's mm -hmm. pretty bad. Do you? What do you think? Do you think I had a fair chance at winning the winning the tournament with my list? Yeah, in fact, I would argue you were the favorite. Yeah, exactly right. So it just goes to show that win rate, and I genuinely thought the same. I mean, I didn't think Josh was a great game. Meant the many game is always going to be tough, but I mean, he probably looks at my list and thinks, okay, that's not a great game. Uh, and then you probably think the exact same. So it just goes to show that there's a lot of context around, you know, players and the win paths at tournaments. You know, you still need things to go right for you, of course. Um, but win rate doesn't really reflect the ability for an army or a faction to do well. And if you're stuck in the mud thinking that is what determines how good armies are at winning any given tournament on any given weekend, then I'm sorry, but it's just not the case. You know, immediately after we made our video and we got our our hate messages from the community, mm -hmm. um, God then won a tournament the week after. Okay, whatever. You know, that goes a little bit over your head because a single week's results don't actually mean too much. Right. You've got to look at a trend. And um, the week after, so this week that just went past, God didn't win a tournament. They went back to normal statistics. Um, and, you know, I have been tagged in so many messages, Dave, <laughs> saying, look, Vic, you see, God aren't broken. They are rubbish. And what I would say is if we look at the, the case of the mysterious case of Sisters of Battle, Mm. who went from absolute nothingness to an archetype being found that was successful. You know, once a few players started looking into it a little bit and creating lists that were made more sense on, for, competitively, mm -hmm. the win rate has skyrocketed on yeah. sisters without their power level having really changed at all. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And my guess is as, um, and you know, the big thing is that the American scene really adopted that particular archetype of sisters. Mm. Yeah. And that's a big pusher in terms of win rates because they play a very high volume of games across the world. Mm. So that's why sisters at the moment are, I think, the highest win rate in the game. Um, really? Or at least one of the top ones, oh, you damn. know. Right, they're above 55% or something crazy at the moment. Um, they must be the best army in the game. Since the data slate. But that exactly, the win rate alone doesn't really say the whole story. You have to look at the context behind it. And you also have to follow a trend over a longer period of time. Yep. Um, like we've played against sisters. We had a little scrim with sisters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and they do not feel like a top-tier army. They just yep. feel like a very good army. Mm-hmm. Um, guard feel like a top-tier army at the highest levels of gameplay. Yeah. And that's when played with good archetypes. And I found, I'm just, okay, rant continuing here. Keep going, brother. I Keep found going. one thing that really gets under my skin Ooh. because last week when God won a tournament, the amount of comments, which was, so first of all, they started off this, Dave. Okay, I'm going back. The week we did the tier list, sure. they, the comments were all about, okay, God can only win if a really good player plays them. Mm-hmm. And then the comments went on to, uh, after God won a tournament, God can only win if they take these Forge World units. Oh, okay. So God aren't actually good. They're only good if you have multiple Forge World units in your army. Yeah. But I will tell you, both you and NASA are not playing any Forge World units in your armies. Get wrecked. And your Zero win... Forge World. Your win rates against other top players, so this is like Team England players and also Ignite players, is above 90%. You know, and in NASA's case, it's almost at a hundred percent. Even you are almost at a hundred percent win rate in in our practice games. In fact, I actually ask for games in our team chat, and no one gets back to me. And NASA asks for games now, and no one, no one can't. It's just silence. <laughs> um, and the thing is, as soon as more people, and I don't think it's a player skill requiring thing. I think as for the kind of win rates that we're quoting. Right to go three two with a good guard archetype does not require you being the best player in the world, which is a sixty percent win rate. Right? Correct. Yeah, it's crazy, right? When you think Six, about it, sixty percent is broken level. Well, sixty exactly. Sixty <laughs> percent is completely broken, and that's just going three and two. You know, right? Yeah. Uh, so. I would say, hold on to this. If there are more guard players picking up not the bloody Forge World models or the exact list that won a single tournament, but the archetype of a cohesive, good competitive list, I think the guard win rate will go up to the tier it should be at if it does. And if it doesn't, that still doesn't mean guard are bad. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think one thing about guard is it's a it's a fundamentals army in a certain sense, right? Like it's a it's a fundamentals army in that you need to make sure your pieces are in the right position. Your sequencing is done hundred percent correctly. You're you're doing your math, right? You need to know you know how your move blocking, getting into combat, where you know prevent yourself from getting tagged, threat range management, um, and I think that that kind of skill set can take people a few a little while to get used to as well you know like it's not i mean everyone's got their opinion of what is fun right or what is not fun or whatever like that um but you know it's guard are actually a really dynamic army mm-hmm. they're really really fast you know reinforcements is a really good stratagem like really good you know respawning kasukin is really really good and it's a part of what makes the army super strong right you know it's just that respawning kasukin with uh, a couple of pieces that have larger direct shooting volumes uh combined with the attrition you know with oc and stuff like that um it gives you a lot of uh, it gives you a lot of ways to play any situation um so yeah i think people really need to start thinking about that if they are if you are playing guard start thinking about that start going a little bit lower to the ground maybe if you're playing you know bigger tanks like rogal dawns or something like that try just investing into smaller things sometimes you know a primary psychic can do as much damage as a rogal dawn and that's just a reality mm-hmm. Yeah, but Dave, guard aren't good unless you take indirect fire, Bulgrins, Kazakin, Leontis, Chimeras, uh, and, and use the stratagems that you have. You know, I'll tell you what, I'd be crazy. Go three and two with zero indirect pieces. 
<laughs> I'm sure I could actually. <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're talking about the wider player base. Obviously, you're you're a world class player. That's different. But I, you know, my point is all around once once people start jumping onto a stronger archetype, and not just saying, "Look, oh, only if you use the good units is your army good." Yes, correct. Use the good units. The army's yeah. good if you use the good units, and they're not like weird units or something. It's a cohesive, balanced guard list. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I 100 percent agree. I noticed comments like that too that uh you know this only does well because of these four good units it's like well this is a competitive environment obviously we're trying to play good combinations of good units like what are we doing here guys yeah i'm sorry you can't win basically you know you can't get a 90 percent win rate if you play 100 death core of kriegs like i'm sorry that's just not a viable way to a successful recipe <laughs> for a and, and it doesn't indicate the power level of the faction yeah. is my fundamental point exactly yeah yeah, um, exactly. But, you know, uh, we don't we don't look at um, space chaos. You know, let's think about chaos space marines before uh, the balanced data slate. Mm. Uh, you know, we don't look at lists and go, oh, you know, he wasn't running. You know, he didn't do very well, and you know, he didn't play three lords of chaos and uh, whatever. Right? It's like, well, yeah, no, it's no surprise that maybe they didn't do well. They're not playing the winning recipes for success as well, right? So mm -hmm. it's important, just as it is, to look at lists that do well and you know think about okay, they're doing well in tournaments, but. Also, the statistics do include people that play super suboptimal units as well, right? Yeah, at, at least when it comes to win rate percentage. E exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's an interesting one. Um, we had, and you know, while we're on this rant, because we'll just we'll just close it up. Maybe this is a good one to end it on. <laughs> yeah. We had some people seem to get so aggravated by the notion of, you know, uh, you know, here's here's a, here's a reality as well is that I understand that Warhammer is a very subjective experience. You have your own personal identity often wrapped in the, the army that you play, right? The faction that you play. And I, I, I suppose, you know, it's a it's a personification of, of, a, of human trait onto onto um, onto an idea, right? Like a concept, a faction, for example, right? So I, I think when people, you know, get the impression of someone, you know, articulating a point about either guard or something like something else, it can feel quite personal. But and, and we had quite a few uh, personal um remarks about you know well you guys are going to be wrong in two weeks time and then we'll all make fun of you it's like well great mate but uh you know you don't need to take it that seriously right it's just it's just our perspective it's just vic and i you know talking about the way that we see things and uh frankly if you disagree with our opinion you can fuck off <laughs> <laughs> and i'll tell you that if you tell me the tournament so <laughs> but that's uh that's that's the way that we run the show right but, you know, <laughs> We do things. Uh, oh, we do gosh. things the way that we want to do them. So, uh, oh gosh, and, uh, we're in for some trouble now. Oh, it's gonna come. Oh, it's gonna if, be beautiful. If you're if you're writing up a three page essay as you're listening to this right now, just press delete, mate. Not read it. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, a little nice piece of satire. Uh, yes. But, um, but I, I was also being quite facetious. And serious yeah, you, uh, you, you, you guys can leave your comments. Of course, it, it encourages a lot of discussion. There was a huge amount of discussion after that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find it quite fight as fascinating. And I will get involved. Yes. I will. Dave is clever. He doesn't. I will get involved in that <laughs> comment section. So. <laughs> I had one person, uh, one person misses me privately and, uh, and saying, you must have the patience of a saint. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll create an anonymous account to uh, shit talk people back or something like that. So, yeah. There we go. <laughs> All right, guys. It's been a great episode. I've enjoyed doing the uh, audio format again, actually. It's kind of nice, you know. That was fun. Focusing on things. So, yeah, it was great. Look, got a good. Uh, Eldari, good fun again. I think they're back to a bit more of a um, interesting play style as well. Mm -hmm. um, Vickers just posted a list today. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, okay, get this, guys. <laughs> we'll, we'll end this on an ironic note because I think this just sums up Vic and I's relationship through and through. Vic has a very public-facing persona, right? You know, indirect is bad for the game. You know, it's non-interactive, and that's the thing that people hate the most. You know, and uh, I'll just say that Vic posted a list in our team chat that had more indirect significantly more in depth than I played in the weekend <laughs> and Eldari. So if you ever think uh, Vic is an honest gentleman, please don't. <laughs> there you go. Episode 45. <laughs> See you guys. Have a good one, guys. Bye. Thank you for listening to the 40K Fireside Podcast. Vic and I hope you've enjoyed listening and we greatly appreciate any feedback that you can provide after the show. There you go. I got one over on you in the end. That was beautiful. <laughs> that was such a funny section at the end. <laughs>